Thanks, kid. I want to start out this morning with a test. Now, don't get scared. You don't need paper and you don't need pencil. The grading is going to be pretty simple. It's pass, fail, and the curve. That means if you don't know it and your neighbor does, you're probably going to be okay. I want you to complete the following phrase. Sticks and stones. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. You all pass. Yay! Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. I was barely, barely, maybe a year into my first pastorate. Summer was just starting, so it's right around that time. I was getting to know the people of Washington Borough, and they were getting to know me. I got a call from someone. Could I go to the hospital and visit this certain person? I didn't recognize them. They weren't a member. Turns out that this was the father of one of the members of the church. He didn't go to church. He didn't have a church affiliation. But could I go to the hospital, stop by and see him? Sure, sure. Okay, tell me what's going on. And, and, and as I listened here, it was obvious. It was kind of serious. But I, I really didn't know what to expect because I didn't know this individual. So I arrived at the hospital, found my way to the floor, found my way to the nurse's station and said who I was and who I was looking for. And as soon as I did, one of the nurses came in around and grabbed me by the hand and took me into a little side room, a little conference room. One of those little rooms that's got a little table and too many chairs. And there was the son and his wife that I knew from church and six or seven other family that I did not. And one, obviously, with the coat that said doctor. And an awful, awful decision to make. Seems that they were gathered there because they were talking about and trying to understand should they now disconnect the machines that were maintaining the man's life? Things had gone down, and all that was keeping him alive were these machines. And they were waiting for me. Oh, yay. What did I think? Should we pull the plug? Sticks and stones can break my bones. But words can never hurt, right? Wrong. Words can help, and words can harm. Words can heal, and words can haunt. Words can create, and words can destroy. Words can give life, and words can take it. How many of you, how many of you here have in the back of your head, you don't think about it normally, but now that I'm mentioning it, you can think and you can look and say, oh yeah. How many of you have in the back of your head a little filing cabinet? A little filing cabinet's got a couple different files in it. There's a file, a little memories of I love yous. And there's a file of I hate you. I wish you'd die. I can't believe. How many of you have that little filing cabinet? Files of I love yous, files of I hate yous, files of you're so special, you are awesome, you are wonderful. And the file is full of things like you're worthless, you're no good, you'll never amount to anything. These words stick with you, don't they? Those words stick with us. We don't always think about them, but they're always there. And you never know when something is going to bring that back and open up one of those files. These kind of words that are inside us. Remember, sticks and stones break my bones, but never, words can never hurt me. These, these words, these files, they can impact us long after the person who said them to us forgets that they said them. They can stick with us and have an impact on us, maybe even after that person is gone from our lives. How many have been affected? How many?
many have been affected or made choices based on something that someone said to us or about us, maybe to our face and maybe joking, <laughs> maybe joking when they didn't think we heard. How many have made choices and decisions based on words like that? Things that were said or things that were left unsaid. Words. Words have power. Words have power. In the beginning, God created with a word. Jesus healed. He calmed storms. He cast out evil spirits. He even raised from the dead with a word. And we who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we await the day when God will fulfill all. And we'll see His final victory established with a word. And when that time comes, who is there here that doesn't long to hear? Well done from our Lord. Words are powerful. Words have a meaning. They have an impact. And yet, as powerful as words can be, often we use them so, so lightly. We fail to consider their effects or the consequences that they can have. But how many messes and how many trials, how many, how many difficulties we wrestle with have their origin in or are intensified by the words that we or others speak or refuse to. Today's text in James chapter 3, you read it quickly, it might seem to ramble a little bit. But it has a lot to say, a lot to say on the subject of the tongue. The words that we say, the words that we use. Some pretty important points and pretty important implications that I hope you will take with you and keep in mind for the next conversation that you have. Even the ones you have before you leave this building. Let's read together. Let me read for you James chapter 3, verse 1 through 12. Follow along in your Bible. I would encourage you, if you have your Bible with you, or take up the Pew Bible and keep it open there so you can look back at some things as we go through. James chapter 3, 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they're so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, to some, it might be a little bit of a rambling text. There's a lot of things going on in there. Let's just take a moment for a little bit of an overview of this text that we have in James today. Verse 1, how many Sunday school teachers out there? How many Sunday school teachers out there? This one's for you. <laughs> a little bit of a warning, Pastor. 
pastors too. A little bit of a warning. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. They're not talking about if you teach seventh grade English or phys ed or something like that. They're talking about teaching God's word. A little bit of a warning. Then in verse 2, James, James he seeks to identify with his readers to draw them all together. We all stumble in many ways. This message is not addressed just to those who teach. This is addressed to everybody. You don't. You teach Sunday school, it's for you. You don't teach Sunday school, it's still for you. We're all in this together. We all stumble in many ways. Then verse 3 and 4 give a couple of examples of how something small can have a big impact. We have the example here of how a bit can move a horse, direct a horse. We have the, the, the example of how a ship is steered by a rudder. Think about that for a second. How many of you have ever ridden a wild beast? I mean a horse. I don't know that I've hit, ridden a, a true horse. I've ridden some ponies or donkey or something a long time ago. But looking at a horse, I, it looks really cool. I love watching movies and cowboys. It looks really cool. But hop up on top of back of one of those things, and the only thing that's making that wild thing stay under control is this little popsicle stick. That's nuts. That's nuts in my opinion. But that's what happens. You put that little popsicle stick there between his teeth, and you yank on a little bit, and you can see left and right and stop. And little tiny bit steers, directs the whole horse. I don't know how much does a horse weigh, Joyce? 2,000 pounds maybe? 1,500? A big one? 1,100? That sounds like 2,000 to me. <laughs> That's a lot. Muscle and a lot of weight. If it goes the wrong way, smushing you up against a fence or a wall or a tree, a little bit moves that whole thing. The same token, think about a rudder. How many of you have ever been on a cruise? You've been on a cruise. You, you hop on a cruise ship, man. You can you can do laps on the cruise ship. Some of those cruise ships, you only have to do about a lap or two, and you've gone a mile. It's huge. And yet the thing that makes it decide whether it's going this way or that, or we're going to go around in circles or figure eights, is, is that rudder, that thing you don't see back there underneath the ship. It's probably a fraction of a percent of the total mass of the whole thing. Little tiny rudder steers that whole thing. Verse 5 begins to drive home what we're talking about. Why are we talking about horses? Why are we talking about ships? It begins to drive it home. And the issue issue here at hand is the tongue. That's what we're going to talk about. How does the tongue drive? How does the tongue steer? Verse 6 gives more of a warning. It's like a flashing danger sign. If you have your Bible open there, verse 6, the tongue is also a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Talk about a big neon flashing warning sign. It's like danger, danger, danger. It kind of makes you, if you think about Jesus' words, it kind of makes you think you should take some drastic action when you think about your tongue. How many of you remember the scripture where Jesus says, you know, if your hand is causing you to sin, cut it off. It's better that you go into life without a hand than be tossed into hell whole. Or if your eye is causing you to sin, gouge it out. So how many of you here have ever uttered a, a, a bad word or, or a stray word that you would take back? That's sinful. Uh, should we like because I don't want to be led down that road. I... I mean, this is drastic stuff if you think about it. The warning that they're giving here and the remedy that Jesus has already talked about in other parts of Scripture, this should be catching our attention. If we're all in this together and we've all got this tongue, check yourself. Do you have a tongue? Touch your nose. Um, do all, <laughs> if we have one of these things, we've got a problem. There's a danger. This, this is for us. Now, verse 7 and 8 again, James broadens it, trying to include all. We, we all have this problem. We all have this problem. You know, birds and animals and sea monsters, you can tame them, no problem. Anybody been to SeaWorld? You can tame those sea monsters. But the tongue, the tongue, verse 8, no human being can tame the tongue. 
I'm not talking about you trying to tame your husband's or your wife's tongue or your child's tongue. Your own tongue. No one can tame the tongue. So we're trying to bring us all in this together that we all have this shared problem. Verse 9 and 10 speak to the realities that everyone can identify with. I'll not ask you if this describes you in some way or another because I know that it does. It does. Absolutely, without fail, every single person has uttered words of praise and uttered words of cursing. Verse 11 and 12 highlight the absurdity of these two things happening together or coming from the same source. Can olives and figs come off the same tree? Can, can figs and grapes? No. It, 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 really, it really is another implicit warning and, and really raises a question for us to consider how on earth is this even possible? The, the teaching here in this passage, 1 to 12, is both blunt and a bit compassionate. There's a problem, but we're all in this together. So maybe we can all figure it out. It raises questions, but the questions seem to be kind of rhetorical in nature. It doesn't exactly go and give you explicit answers. So I want to drill down on a couple things here in this text as we think about the tongue. Remember, we've all got one. I want us to drill down on a couple things. First of all, we are talking about a little thing. A seemingly simple, even silly little thing, the tongue. Think, think about how small the tongue is. How silly it is. I want you to do something. Turn to the person closest to you and do this. <laughs> Go ahead. The folks in the first service did, and they don't usually follow my directions. Come on. Turn to the person close to you and do this. Let's see it. It's silly, isn't it? There's hardly a person who can stick out their tongue and they don't laugh. Or it makes somebody else laugh. Or you both laugh. It's a silly, simple little thing. But do not be fooled for how simple and how silly it might seem to be. It can have a huge impact. A huge impact. Verse 3 and 4, that bit about the, the bit and the horse, the rudder and the ship, is trying to make that point. Little bit, big horse, change. Little rudder, big ship, change. Little tongue, body, big changes, big impact. You know, when you think about it, it really reminds me the parable that Jesus taught about the kingdom where the kingdom is like a mustard seed. How many gardeners out there do we have? Have you ever planted mustard? How many of you got some southern roots? Come on, own up to it here. A little mustard greens with some fat back or some bacon or something. I know Eddie's all about that. <laughs> he goes places I can't either. He eats okra. I can't. <laughs> if you've ever planted mustard, if you've ever planted mustard, you dump out a pack of mustard seeds... In, in your hand, don't sneeze. Because like a thousand mustard seeds looks like about a thousand little fly specks. And if you breathe wrong, they're gone. It is tiny. Try to pick one up by itself sometime for fun. Just one mustard seed. It's like a one of those infuriating little games that you could play. It's teensy, weensy, weensy, weensy. But what the scripture tells us is that that little mustard seed will grow into the biggest plant in the garden. Now, they have a little different mustard over in the Middle East than what we're talking about. We're not talking about the leafy little stuff like this. Their mustard over there, it grows into a plant that's big enough. Birds perch in it. It provides cover for the birds of the air. This tiny, tiny, tiny little seed, tiny, tiny, tiny little seed grows into something there that has a huge impact. It dominates the garden. It dominates it. Birds shelter in it. What silly little words of yours are being built into, well, what? What, what is there that you say you might not even think about? You're just, just, just missing it. And what's it turn into? Something to think about. A tiny mustard seed, huge plant. What about your words? Are they being built into something good or something else? Second point. Second point that I would make kind of relates to that. Our words, all, all of our words have potential. 
Now, if you're in the garden and you're planting, you can get that pack of mustard seeds and you plant them. Probably most of them are going to come up if they're fresh seeds, if they're good seeds. But if you were to count them out, <laughs> invariably, there's a seed or two that doesn't grow, right? If you take some old seeds, you might find there's a whole bunch that don't grow. But you take our words and every word you speak, every word that crosses your lips or rolls off your tongue has potential, incredible potential. And the way the scripture focuses here, the way it focuses here in verse 6 is this incredible potential for evil. This is that verse there that the tongue is a fire and the world of evil among the parts of the body it corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. It's some serious potential, some serious potential in our words and we cannot cannot must not dare not dismiss this or take it for granted how many of the things that you say or how many of the things that are said to you people try to just dismiss oh <laughs> i didn't mean it you know patrick that's a horrible haircut oh i didn't mean it <laughs> patty i hate your glasses oh i didn't mean it i'm just kidding i'm just kidding our words have incredible potential and we cannot dismiss them and just act like we didn't say them or they don't matter. Every word matters, especially because they do have that potential. And the, the third thing that I would say here related to all this, we need to bring it all together. They are hard to control. They are hard to control, aren't they? Verse 8, in fact, tells us no human being can tame the tongue. What does that mean? That means words are going to come out and we're not going to like the way they sound. Words are going to come out and we wish that we hadn't said them. Words are going to come out and we wish we could take them back. Words are going to come out when we don't want them to come out in ways that we don't want them to come out. But we're going to say them anyway. It reminds me of the scripture from Romans. Where Paul, where Paul says that the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. Do. That's the way it is with words. Sometimes stuff just comes blurting out. We don't control ourselves the way that we ought to control ourselves. Every time you say or someone says to you, oops, that just slipped out. Or, oh, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. All those little things, at least for that moment, is a snapshot of your heart. We may try to dismiss them. We may try to just <clears throat> let them go. But the, the little joke that bites us a little bit, the little dig that, oh, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I didn't mean it, I didn't mean it. At least for a moment in time, as a snapshot of what was in the heart, we need to beware. These three things I want you to see and understand about the words and the words we speak, the way that we speak that come from James' text today, understand that all three of these they're warnings. These are considerations that we need to keep in mind every time we open our mouths. Every time we speak with anyone we speak with, we need to understand the potential that we have to help or to harm. We need to understand the dangers of what we are saying. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't speak and we shouldn't speak truth especially, but we need to be careful about our words and not just say whatever rolls off our tongue without thinking. As I said in the beginning, often we're just very unaware or unthinking when it comes to what we say. People talk to us and we talk to them and we say whatever comes out of our mouth without a thought or so little that it amounts to the same thing. Words spill out. So little thought. So little de deliberation. But words matter. Words have power. Words have potential. Now, I want to say something here. It's not all doom and gloom, okay? We should not all take a vow of silence, only some of us. <laughs> it's not all doom and gloom. See, there are two ways that our words can come out. There are two potentials that can come from the things that we speak. Specifically, blessing or cursing. And these are suggested, these are suggested in, in, in verse, um, verse 11 and 12 where it's talking about figs and olives and olives and, and grapes. There's, there's two different potentials 
potentials, two different ways that our words might be experienced, shared and experienced by others. But we need to note when we speak these words and there are two potentials that could result from the things that we say, these two things cannot coexist. It is one or the other. It's olives or it's figs. It's figs or it's grapes. It's blessing or it is cursing. The two paths are not compatible. We're not doomed, although it tells us that we on our own cannot speak anything good. We're not doomed that every single thing we say is bad. There is a choice. There's a, there's a different path. But we need to understand it's this path or that path. Two ways cannot live inside us. It really is one way or the other. Our words and our actions will only, only add up to one sum, not two. If you think about taking, think about math class, and you take this figure and that figure and add them together, it can only add up to one result. So our words positive, our words negative, our words blessing, our words cursing, they're only going to add up to one thing. One thing. No matter what we think, no matter what we mean to convey, we will be seen and heard one way or the other by everyone that we relate to. These silly little words, these simple little words that roll off are going to show us one way or the other. What makes the difference? What will be seen? What makes the difference? What will be heard? What makes the difference? The way that we will be seen by others. What determines whether our words will hurt or heal? Whether our words will hinder or help? Whether our words will bless or curse? Whether we will witness the world or the Savior of the world? The answer to that question is simple, really. It boils down to who is in control of our words. Who holds the reins? on our tongue? Who holds the reins on that bit? Whose hand is on the rudder? Whose hand is steering our tongue? Verse 8, let me remind you what we read. Verse 8, no human being can tame the tongue. How can we choose to bless instead of curse? Is there any point? Should we even try? Yes, we can choose and we can be certain. We can make the choice to change these things for the good this way by allowing God to be in control. Allowing God to be in control. On our own, we're not going to produce the witness we should even if we want to. But if we surrender our hearts to God, if we give our lives to Christ, God in control, we can produce blessing. That's the key. Put God in control. Not just of your life. People say, oh, God's in control of my life. And what do they do? They do whatever they want to do. You need God control in your life. You need God control of your heart. You need control, God in control of everything about you. And then what comes out will be a blessing. A final note here as we think about this scripture, as we think about this scripture today, notice the scripture, it, it just ends, you know, can, can figs and olives, can olives and grapes come the same place? It, it, it ends not really with any resolution, not explicitly. It's just kind of a question hanging. You've got to personalize yourself. Leaves us with a choice. We really must choose. You can't have it both ways. Salt water or fresh, olives or figs, blessing or cursing. Which will it be from everyone who reads or hears these words? More importantly, which one will it be from you? It depends on who is in control. Are you? Or is God really on that?